Older men are to be level-headed. Very self-explanatory. Worthy of respect. Sensible and sound in faith. Love and endurance. I don't need to explain any of that, right? It makes sense. In the same way, older women are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not addicted to much wine. And pay attention to this. I'm going to dwell on this a little bit. They are to teach. Everybody say teach. What is good? Let me pause here. You will see that um, older men and older women are expected to live the way that they ought to, be, ought to live. And the reason is because you are examples to the younger ones. Many of our, I, I'm a Gen X. I think I'm Gen X. Right after Zoomer, right? A boomer, Zoomer. Zoomer, boomer, right? <laughs> Um, a rather boomer, uh, you know, we're Gen X, and so in, in our Gen X generation, and therefore I, I don't believe us Gen X, um, to be honest with you, have done a great job. And, and, and the Gen Xers, we, we have lived a life that, you know, we, we, we didn't really care about the next generation that much, and it's always us four and no more. We grew up a Gen X, especially in North America, to be very self-focused, and it's just us. And so consequently, the generation after us have nobody to look up to. They don't know how to be good believers. And so they are confused as to how to be good believers. They say, well, yeah, they can go to the Bible. But you know, many people don't know how to go to the Bible. They don't even know where to start. And so I want to encourage you. You know, many of you are at my age, Gen Xers. Some of you are older, but I still consider you young. And you could be um, the boomers, you know. Praise God. Hallelujah. I won't ask the boomers to raise their hands because you, you know, praise the Lord. But the Gen Xers and Gen, Gen, Gen Millennials too. Listen, Millennials, you're getting older now. And so we, I want to encourage you to become whatever decision you make. I'm talking about small decisions, not large ones, not about buying a house, a car, but small little decision that you make. Be aware that somebody is looking for an example of the decision you make. You don't think, you may not think it's important, those decisions you make. You may not think, ah, it just doesn't affect anybody. It's just me and myself, you know, who cares? But somebody is looking for an example. And somebody may be looking at you. I want to tell you that some of you, I'm so glad that you all came today. And no condemnation for people didn't come, I can understand, because the people are sick, we're in the season where people are get catching all kinds of... But I, was, I woke up this morning, I look at all the drizzles and rain, and, and when I came to church, I was super blessed. The people that come with bus. You are an example, a tremendous example for the many younger believers. Because when they see you, they go, ha, huh, I ought to be as faithful. Are you here this morning? Yes. And when it comes to prayer, when it comes to consistency to do kindness, when it comes to serving, somebody is looking at you. You say, I've been in the church for three, three weeks. That's enough. Somebody is looking at you. You're not here as an audience. You're here to be a teacher, either through your action or through your words. Now, Paul the Apostle went on to speak to the older woman. They are to teach what is good. Now, I want to kind of focus here a little bit because these days, especially the last couple of years, have been a big controversies 
in the United States, especially because um, the South Southern Baptist Convention had just been split into different parts because the Southern Baptist Convention insists that women cannot teach and become pastor. And so there many Southern Baptist uh, churches are now no longer Southern Baptist churches because the denomination insists that women are not supposed to preach. And so notice here, and they, 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 what they do is they use 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 34. When you have time, you can look at it. But what I want to tell you is that you notice here is that women are encouraged to teach. Unlike what some suppose Paul was trying to insist in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 34. What is the contradiction? I propose to you that Paul intention, I need you to listen to this very carefully. I will offend you, but praise God. Paul's intention in preaching the gospel was not to change the culture. Especially the culture that was not in contradiction to the word of God, uh, to the word of God, to the Bible. Paul, however radical he was in terms of preaching the gospel, was not a cultural warrior. Do you see the difference? His mandate, and therefore the mandate of this church and purpose was and is to preach the gospel, period. Let me give you an example. In verse 9 and 10, Paul was instructing slaves how they ought to live as Christians. So you hear people say that this Bible is no good because it promotes slavery, but it doesn't mean that Paul was promoting slavery. It's another example that he is not trying to fight the culture at the time. He even said it's wrong in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10. He equates slavery as those who are as evil as people committing sexual immorality, sexually twisted, liars, deceivers. He equates them to be the worst of so sinners in the eyes of believers. How can you say that Paul was proposing slavery? But what Paul was instructing the church and the believers at the time is to tell them to live in the society that they were in, but not to be a cultural warrior. And we should, and we are not called to be cultural warriors. I know some, many people disagree with that. We're not called to be cultural warriors. But listen to this. When the gospel is truly preached... People are truly convicted under the Holy Spirit. And then society at large become a place where the move of God is happening. We call it revival. You can bet. Yes, I'm using a bad word called bet. You can bet that the culture in society will change. It is impossible for an individual to be born again and not change. And so the same thing is that it's impossible that a society that is going to revival that would not change and keep the sinful way. The key for us believers, you and I, me as a pastor and you and I, need to understand is this, is that I'm not called, this church is not called, or the church of Jesus Christ is not called to be cultural warriors. We're called to love people and preach the gospel, we know that the message of the gospel and the conviction of the Holy Spirit will change lives, and as they change lives, they change society. So you don't have to go fight and become a culture warrior. All you have to do is to preach the love of Jesus and understand that the Holy Spirit will change lives. Then you know, in politics, especially in democracy, the most powerful form of influence is grassroots movement. Is it not? And can you imagine the grassroots movements of Canada become a movement not of a political party or a certain ideology, but a movement of God? And when the movement of God takes place, I'll tell you, politicians will follow. Politicians always follow. They'll do the most popular thing. When believers in mass say, we don't want to watch NHL anymore on Sunday afternoon, NHL won't happen. (laughs) Or baseball won't happen. 
or any of the culture thing that will happen. You know, I know when Premier Bob Ray was the premier in this province years ago, I was 24. That was a long time ago. <laughs> he changed the law in this province and therefore led the way to the entire country to allow shopping malls to be open on Sunday. There are people that cannot come to church today, I know of, because they have to work on Sunday. Well, you can thank Mr. Bob Ray. And Mr. Bob Ray was able to do it because he discovered most Ontarians were not going to church anyways. You can fight him, but instead of that, we ought to pray for revival. Are you here this morning? So it doesn't mean that, you know, when Paul is in 1 Corinthians, what I'm talking about is when Paul in 1 Corinthians speak about, oh, women shouldn't be teach, and people just take it out of context and say, here, there it is, you shouldn't be preached. You know, it's, I just feel like it's nonsense. I should hear a big amen from the ladies. Not strong enough. Not convincing, right? Come on. Now, let's go to verse 4. Still talking to the older woman. So they may encourage the young woman to love the husband. Ooh, nice. (laughs) And to love their children. And um, so older woman, the young woman needs you. When you share with them, don't talk about whatever. Talk about loving God, loving their homes, loving their husband. Both the husband is a believer. You got to do it even more so. Now I'm going to dwell on verse 5 and 6 a little bit because we're talking to now the young people to be self-controlled, pure, homemakers, kind, submissive to their husbands so that God's message will not be slander. Verse 6, same way to the young man to be self-controlled. Everybody say self-control. Now, the other ones about submissive and whatever, I will leave that to your small group to do a debate, okay? And uh, you guys can have a, have, a, have a battle on that one. Praise God. I, this, I know this week many of you are having a Christmas get-together. I might sneak into some of the small groups because Christmas is a good time for me to go eat, right? Praise God. I'll visit you. <laughs> I, and I want to thank you for all the different invitations. But anyway, so you might not want to fight over the Christmas meal like many families, but praise God. Okay, so here, you know, we talk about self-control. Now, some of the older one in faith, we are not to continue to be babes, or continue to live our lives for ourselves. We are to start investing in others, leading the younger ones. We always pray and hope for the next generation to rise up. How? You see, if no one teach the younger generation, you know where they're going to get the teaching from? YouTube. Today, YouTube is a teacher for many people, and YouTube is messed up because the algorithm will feed you whatever you like. If you watch different games on YouTube, all you're feeding is going to be games. And if you watch some communist, I hope there's no comments here. If you want to say some communist doctrinal, state, doctrinal teaching, then you have all the communist teaching in YouTube. It doesn't mean they're real. It doesn't mean everybody all of a sudden become communist. It's just the algorithm is feeding you whatever that you are watching and whatever you're listening to. But if there's no younger generation, if no older generations available to teach the younger generation, who is going to teach them? I want to speak to some of your older ones. Some of you don't know, so you say you're not old. Well, if you're over 40, I think you're in that category. Come on, just, just hear me out, okay? 
Just hear me out. Okay, don't get mad. Come on. I have a reason to say that. And if you're over 50 and 60, you ought to listen to it even more carefully. Do you realize many young people are dying for a mentor? Do you realize that? They're dying for somebody to come along and say, come, let's go have lunch. On Sunday morning, if you walk around, even in this church, if you see a young person and you approach a young person, some of you husband and wife, you approach a young person and say, yeah, why don't you come to lunch with us? Do you know what that would do to that person? It would change the world. You can change somebody else's world right now, today. Especially some of you older one. Man, I tell you, people would be so grateful if you pay attention to them and say, I am going to help you, help you in this lifetime. So if you're 40 or over, you are there. If no one ever teach them and disciple them, who's going to do it? I want to encourage you, some of the older ones, I already shared with you what I think the older is. You're young, older, okay? Like, I'll give you this. You are younger, older people. Does that make sense? <laughs> if you arise in this hour to disciple, teach and show the way to the gen- younger generation, then when you are seniors in your years, you will not be sitting in your senior retirement home and keep shaking your head, looking at the TV. Oh my goodness, what have our society come to? You're not going to hate me for what I want to say next, okay? And my mom is looking at me, she's in the same category, okay? So some of the older people, you sit there and you watch TV and you go... I don't know what this world has become to. May I propose to you that people in your generation did not rise up to disciple the next generation. So they decided their own moral values. They have decided what is right and right, wrong on their own because no one, no Christians, no believers were available to reach out. The thing that you can do, though, for the older one, is you can make a huge difference if you begin to get on your knees and pray for the next generation. Pray for us. We need your courage. We need the courage to disciple the next generation. We need the grace to disciple the next generation. We need, we need the strength, the faith to pick somebody up and say, I will mentor you because it's tough, it's heavy. It takes a lot of sacrifice. I want to ask those who consider this as their home church to begin to think that way, to live that way, to live for the next generation, to think for the next generation. Well, let me get back to self-control. You can demonstrate to the next generation the best way to live with your self-control. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 32. I don't have the scripture for you. You can, you, you can turn, turn uh, you know, look for it. It tells us that those who have self-control are more powerful than those who can conquer city. And I want you to pay attention to this. Notice when Paul is teaching or telling Titus to... Sh- to have the older people to teach the younger generation self-control, it would seem that he's focusing his attention to the younger people in this, in this discipline called self-control. The reason is because the younger you are, the harder it is to have self-control. How do you know that, Pastor Paul? Because I was young before. It was very hard. It was very hard to have self-control. I'm, I'm telling you, I felt it harder, hardest to refrain from eating fat food when I was younger. Much harder. And going to the gym, forget it. 
I mean, I see my son goes to gym all the time. He's like 10 times more self-disciplined than me. When I was his age, Jim, I, I excused myself saying, you know, I'm more spiritual. That's the most important thing. Forget about just, you know, I can eat all I want. Jesus is coming back anyway, so who cares? That was my excuse. And in terms of reading the Word of God, it was a challenge. My goodness, reading the Bible every day. Oh, Lord. Just looking at it made me dizzy. It was hard to have self-control. And that's why younger people need us older ones to help them, to encourage them to have self-control. To say, come on. You can do it. Have some self-control in reading the Word of God. Have some discipline to pray. Have some discipline to take care of yourself. Have some discipline in your life. Have both spiritual discipline and physical discipline. In today's Christian world, you know, he, he, you, you, you might have heard advice um, from people to say that, you know, don't worry about self-control, you know. Just, just, just when you're with the Romans, be like the Romans, you know. They're gluttonous and they eat all they want. Be like them. When with the Greek, eat, be like the Greek. And when with the Jews, you know, poor you, you know, can't eat anything. Be like them. You can hear people talk like that. You know, I was, I was meditating on 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9. Let me tell you something. For those of you who read the Bible, if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 8 one day, and then you go to the next day, you read 1 Corinthians chapter 9, it will sound quite different if you read the both chapters together. You can experiment it. It's pretty interesting. If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 8, you know, one chapter a day, right? One chapter a day. And then you wait till the next day, because you will not remember what you read on, on chapter 8, and you read chapter 9. It will sound quite different. And many people break down 8 and 9 and preach separate sermons, but it's actually one thought together. Right? So, he, uh, so let, me, let me give you, I, I, I'm, I'm talking about self-control, right? So, so he was talking to the church in, in Corinthians. He started by exhorting those who considered themselves more knowledgeable about the grace of God. He said this. He said, some of you understand that idols have no power. Idols is useless, and therefore, whatever offered to idols is just like offered to woods. It's nothing. So you have this great faith. And so they would find themselves eating meat in those temples, temples that were uh, used to offer meat to idols. Because they feel like they've been set free, they've been liberated in their mind, they know that there's only one God and serving only one true God. All these idols are just for naive people, childish people, because they're powerless, they're nothing. Greater is he that's in me than all this idol that's in the world. They got no power. And so they go ahead and just eat all the meat they want to eat. And Paul is saying, do not be selfish. Have some self-control. For what? For the young Younger Christians who may not have the faith that you have, they still believe there's some kind of power. Yeah, they're still naive. Yeah, they're not grown yet, but they're very, very tender in their faith. And if they see you eating meat in the temple, then they'll think to themselves, I guess it's okay to worship idols too. And they'll come to the wrong conclusion, and you become the one who offend their faith and ruin their faith. Yes, it's powerless. Yes, it's useless. Yes, your knowledge may be true. But for the sake of the younger Christians, reframe yourself a little bit. Have some self-control. Not for you. Not for your fitness. But for other people. And then in chapter 9, he said, I too have all the rights in the world. I can have salary like everybody. I can have a wife like all the apostles. I can do everything. He said, who in the world will fight on their own expense? Who in the world will not eat from their own vineyard? But he said, for the sake of the gospel, I refrain from my own rights. Therefore, you too for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of the younger ones, refrain from your rights. Don't say, well, you know, I have the right. I know the knowledge. I have the grace of God. 
But even if you do have all those knowledge, which Paul said puffs you up anyways, refrain. Have some self-control. Have some discipline, not for yourself, but for the younger generation, for the younger ones in faith. Do you understand? And that's why self-control is very, very important. For the sake of those who had less faith, lest they become stumbling block to those who are younger in faith, less knowledgeable in faith for the sake of the gospel. And so, you know, um, and then at the end of chapter 9, he started this statement that I preach all the time. I talk about all the time. He said, you know, Exercising discipline must have a goal. Exercising discipline must have a goal. But you exercise discipline because you have a goal. And then he went on to say that, but our faith should have goals. Because if your faith have no goals, you'll be a boxer boxing the air. You be athlete that trains for nothing. You know, people that train for nothing, they have no goals, they will not see progress. But they say that you refrain yourself because there's a goal in your faith. You're not fighting in vain, you're not beating the air. There is a purpose, there is a reason. And he explained to them about the younger generation, how they ought to be careful, how they, you know, how to reframe themselves, have some discipline in themselves, not for themselves, but for the younger generation. And then he concluded in saying, I beat my body. I bring it into subjection, lest that by any means I preach the gospel, I myself become a castaway. Hmm. But wait a minute, you're a grace guy. Yeah, he's a grace guy. I beat my body is a King James Version, so don't go beat your body. Don't go home and use a whip to go. No, don't do that. It's a King James English. It means I discipline my body. I bring it into subjection. Are you bringing your body into subjection or you subject your body? Which one is it? 2024 is coming. I want to encourage you, every believer in this church, to begin to cultivate some discipline in your life. And it's a good start, January 1st, to have discipline in studying the Word, reading the Word of God, discipline in praying in the morning or praying whenever. Have consistency. Discipline means you have consistency in what you committed to do. Consistency. So therefore, you do not want to be way too ambitious because you'll be too hard. Just become, make some discipline that is doable for you. Know your strength. Everybody say, know your strength. You know how much you can read the Word of God. Don't go 10 chapters a day. You won't last. Know your strength. You know, I don't know my strength even these days. And um, this, some of you who know me closer, you know that I've injured myself many places, like the shoulder here, because I look at all the young people in the gym, they were carrying all this heavy weight, and I thought to myself, oh, I can do it too. Ah! Oh, okay. <laughs> Now I have to say to myself, I'm getting older. That is such a hard truth, you know? Like I said, wow, I'm not getting older. I was thinking of myself yesterday. Oh, yeah, I guess we're just going downhill from here. I said, no, I can't believe that. I can't believe that. Look at Arnold, man. He's still all muscly, whatever. So I can still keep going, right? But you know, you need to know your strength because I don't know my strength and therefore I injure myself. Know your strength. Know how much you can take. But discipline, you and I must cultivate. Self-control, you and I must cultivate. Self-control, self-discipline. Listen, in each and every area of our lives, whether it is your money, whether it is your health, and we're talking about spiritual faith, your level of success in any area of your life, listen, hinges very much in the level of discipline you have. Should I repeat that? 
the level of your success in any area of your life, any, from academia to finances to family relationship to career to your body to whatever, in our context is spiritual discipline. In every area, including spiritual, your spiritual faith, your spirituality. Listen to me very carefully, Christian. Don't kid yourself. Coming to church once a while, reading the Bible once a while, doing things once a while inconsistently is not discipline. You know, and you know it's true, is that every area of life, every area, the level of our success in any area of our life hinges very much in the level of discipline that we have. Very much. And you know, if you, if you examine your life at the end of 2023, we're in the last month now, hello. You say, you know, I, you go ahead and sit down and just begin to write, write down, okay, I, I, need this, I, need, I need more money. I need to be healthier. I need to be able to hear from God better. I need to know the word of God better. I need to be more spiritually mature. We write it down, all your needs. I need to be healthier. And if those areas that you wrote down that you see that you need more, it should tell you very quickly that if there's no success at all in any of the areas that you write down, the chances are there is no discipline in those areas or very little. You want to succeed in life, Succeed in your spiritual walk, succeed in your finances, succeed in your health, succeed in your relationship. It demands discipline. Yes, relationship. I was listening to, uh, <laughs> you know, it's in my feed, Jordan Peterson. And him and his daughter and his wife and his son. And... Um, they have very close relationships. The kids all grown up now. The daughter, she's uh, very famous herself, whatever. They're very close. And um, the interviewer was talking to them. And this is what they say. I could be very busy in teaching university, whatever. But I will make sure that every evening it's sacred to my family. They will not miss me. Hmm. That's a discipline there, don't you think? Because so easy, because some of us are very career-oriented, and then at 5 o'clock, you know, I used to work for a Japanese company, and uh, I hope I don't sound racist, but praise the Lord. So I work for, <laughs> and the Japanese, my Japanese boss was brutal. And so I remember that, you know, I would walk by his office during the day, because my office is closed by his office, right there. And then he would, he would cross his leg, he would sit down, he would be, I, I think he's sleeping all day long, right? And then at five o'clock, always five, he calls for the management meeting. Every single day. I was thinking about you, you sleep all day and you're calling management meeting at five o'clock. And you know, those meetings last not half an hour. It lasts a long time. And you know, sometimes it's very hard to say no to our boss. Is it not? It's very hard, especially when you're trying to climb the ladder. But you know, every area of a life that is lacking is because there is a lack of discipline. And you know, at the, 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 the verse five and six we talked about just now is that the younger you are, the harder, the tougher time it is for you to discipline yourself because you have less patience. Young people these days, they have ADHD, right? Like, Many of them looks like they, they just can't focus on one thing. And so it's harder to have some kind of discipline. I was, my wife was telling me, 
about a studying technique. It blew my mind. She, she, she was having a conversation with my kids. She was trying to tell my son how to study effectively. And this is how you study. You study for what, 10 minutes? 25 minutes, and then you take a break for five minutes. And, uh, you know, but you said 10 minutes or something like that, right? You told Matthew, 10 minutes, and you take a break. I said, you haven't even got started yet when you have 10 minutes. And then now you have to take a break. You have 10 minutes, right? It's hard. It's hard. It's hard to stay the course. It's hard to see some of the young men just study in the library. I know I was like that. I remember when I was going to U of T, robots, right? Robots, you know, low robots library. And at the end, at the bottom of the library, they have horrible food. I still go there every 20 minutes to look for food. Tasted awful. But nevertheless, I needed to move around. So it's harder for young people to stay disciplined. And that's why we want to encourage you young people is to stay disciplined. Right? And, uh, but it becomes, as you press in, it becomes easier and easier and easier. Praise God. Now, um, discipline, watch this. It's about delay gratification. Yes or no? Delay gratification. That is a key to all the discipline. Because if you can discipline yourself, in my words, you delay your gratification. Then the, the joy when you achieve it is, is, is fireworks. It's amazing. You know, uh, this week, uh, some few of you sent me different things about Charlie Munger. Do you know who Charlie Munger is? Sounds like a fruit, right? Charlie Munger. Charlie Munger is one of the most successful investors in the world. He's a vice chair to Warren Buffett in the Berkshire Hathaway Company. So he is like the, you know, he is like the the partner for Charlie, for, for Warren Buffett. Anyways, he died, and so everybody's sending out, you know, different sets of principle that he has. And one of the things that I noticed that he talked about uh, when it comes to um, uh, life itself is that he says, you know, life has to do a lot with deferred gratification because you prefer life that way. He's not even a Christian. Life has a lot to do with deferred gratification because you prefer life that way. When you de- defer gratification, joy is much more immense. You know, a lot of people do fasting in January. It's hard, right? How many of you like fasting? Show me your hand. What's wrong with you, man? Like, why? You are so amazing. I, I, fasting is a challenge for me. But I do notice when I fast, food tastes much better at the end. It's like a hot dog would mean the world to me. You know, this day we have so much food that it doesn't taste like anything anymore. You know, Proverbs say that those who overeat honey will find it tasteless. Delay gratification, increase gratification in every area of your life. So learn, you know, um, I know a lot of people are starting to think about doing 21 days fast. You know, we used to have a corporate 21 days fast. We don't do that anymore. But if you want to do 21 days fast, by all means, go for it. You know, it will help you a lot. Um, speaking of the, the, you know a, a discipline, you know he he talked about uh, he talked about um, uh, he's ninety he was ninety nine years old, and he said he he moved into a small house with his wife when he was twenty nine, and he stayed there until the day he died. He said many of my friends got bigger house whatever, but we 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 held back. And people say, why do you do that? Both him and Warren Buffett, they, they stay in a little house, the original house that they live in. And, and they say, why do you do that? And Charlie Munger said, it's for my kids. I don't want them to have any idea about 
excessive living. He says, for them. That's why he's staying. I mean, he's a guy worth billions of dollars, right? But the key is, believers, I need to encourage you, in 2024, may your year be marked by a year of great spiritual discipline. Everything you do in the spirit, if it's got discipline, man, I tell you, you will soar in your faith. You will soar in your spirituality. Put some discipline and self-control. Let me start at the close. Verse 11. The word is started to close. For the grace of God has appeared with salvation for all people, instructing us to deny godlessness and worldly lusts and to live in a sensible, righteous, and godly way in this present age. Sounds like another discipline. Denying godlessness and worldly lusts. You know, I was having a devotion with the Lord this morning, Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Jesus say, he that follow me shall what? Deny themselves. That's the ultimate discipline. Deny yourself. You may have all the rights in the world, but for the sake of the gospel, I'm going to put a hold on that. Put a hold on my rights. And uh, let's go to chapter 3, and I'm going to start close. I'm going to close. I'm, I'm just a couple of points, okay? This is to remind all believers to be submissive to rulers and authorities. Turn to your neighbor and say, submit to rulers and authorities. Do we have to do that? You know, especially among Christendom, right? Do we have, what do you mean? What if they, now one day, if they say to you, you cannot worship Jesus anymore, you should deny Christ, you submit to to their punishment. That's what Daniel used to do. Daniel didn't go, well, I have my rights. I do not want to worship, I have my rights. But Daniel yielded. And he was thrown into the lion dens and his friend, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What a complicated name, eh? I used to hear Jen, that, uh, Jesse Duplantis used to say, my shack, your shack, and the bungalow, right? That's how I remember it. My shack, your shack, and the bungalow, right? <laughs> Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. My shack, your shack, and the bungalow, right? But, you know, they got thrown into the fire. God didn't come and rescue them. They got thrown there first. When they tell you you do not worship God, you stand on your faith. Apart from that, we're not a culture warrior. We submit to authorities. To obey, to be ready for every good works. Verse 2, to slander no one, to avoid fighting, road rage, to be kind and always showing gentleness. We preach about that. For we too were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by various passions and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, detesting, detesting one another. I'm going to close with this now. Seriously, verse 5. Avoid, verse 9, sorry, avoid foolish debates. Now, Paul, in context, as I talked about last week, is there people coming in here talking about in the church Judaism, rules, genealogies, this sort of thing. Paul said, don't, don't debate them. Know your faith, but don't debate them. And disputes about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. Have you ever found yourself disputing with people about your theology? Well, don't worry about it. You cannot convince anybody to believe in your theology, especially those Christians. Every Christian has their own theology. Don't worry about it. Don't, Don't debate. Don't get into debates with other Christians. I always say this, pick your battles. 
Pick your battles. Don't have to win every game. Don't have to win every debate. Verse 10, reject a divisive person after the first and second warning, knowing that such a person is perverted and sins being self-condemned. You know, uh, the Bible in Proverbs 26, verse 20, I don't know if I have that, it said, without wood, fire goes out. Without gossip, conflict dies down. Have you met a gossiper? We all have met gossiper. Right? Especially, I'll tell you, I'll be honest with you, sometimes among some of us pastors, we gossip. And the Holy Spirit convicted me one number of years ago. I have a really good friend. He was very powerful denomination leaders, and, but he's very nice to me. So he, you know, I'm not part of his denomination, but you know, we know many common friends. And so every time he flies in from Alberta, he'd take me out for lunch and we'd chit chat and then he would fill me in all the gossips. And so, you know, as a younger person, I kind of chime in, right? You try, you're trying to be help, you know, like, yeah, 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 it's true, it's true, it's true. So I chime in. I did not instigate those gossip, but to my shocking, it came back to me from another party that I said what I was chiming in for. I said, I didn't say a thing. I was just chiming in and go, yeah, that's right, you know, try to be a nice guy. So from that point onwards, I decided that when, he, no. So he came another time, he took me out for lunch, he started to go again. I didn't say a word. I just smiled and nod my head. Didn't say a word. That was the last lunch I got from him. Praise God. But we should not be divisive as Christians. You know, if somebody come to you and tell you about another brothers and sisters in this church, you have my permission to shut them down. Can I have an agreement? Come on, let's agree on that, right? So, so if anyone ever come to you from outside, the people that had left the church or the people that... Anyone ever come to you to gossip about another brothers and sisters or me, right? <laughs> Shut them down in Jesus' name. You know, I, 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 I do know, appreciate that there are people that come from different hurting environments that they've been hurt by church leaders and whatnot. I get that. And God's going to heal you. But to repeat what you know, somebody had hurt you, the things that people have done to you, means that you have not forgiven them and you have not been released from that hurt and therefore God can't heal you. If you want God to heal you of the hurt that has been inflicted upon you, you forgive and let go and the Spirit of God will heal you. If you keep repeating and rehashing and relitigating the pain that has been inflicted on you, he can never heal you because you've closed the door. So in this house, in this church you were watching, I know today it's raining, a lot of people are not here, but if in this house, I want to encourage you. If any hurt that's been inflicted upon you by people in this church or outside the church, forgive and let God do the healing over your life and he will heal you. Now, if you disagree with me doctrinally, don't need to gossip. I was telling a brother, you know, this morning, I said, I said this brother, you know, um, I actually encourage him not to, to come to this church because after the service, he would gather around a group of people and tell them how wrong my preaching was. It's like, what? Yeah, you, you, you shouldn't be here. You know, I like a lot of people here, but no. If you're causing division, you, you, you. And I said, I only, I don't say that to many people, and he's one of the very unique ones. Maybe he, I, I said this, I quote this exactly. Maybe there's another place that will agree with your theology. Go to that place. You'll be happier. Don't need to go gossip and, oh, I don't believe in this grace thing and blah, 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 whatever. Just, just, just go to another place that they love what you love. Amen? Can we stand, please, worship team?